Hi, I'm Martin Brodsky. I'm going to speak to you today about deriving clinical meaning from medical chart review. My financial disclosures are that I'm employed by Johns Hopkins University. My research is funded by NIH and very specifically right now NIDCD. I am receiving financial compensation from ASHA for this presentation and I don't have any fi non-financial disclosures. The goals for this session are explain the goals for medical chart review, reason which areas of the medical chart are needed to inform speech language pathology diagnosis and treatment goals, and reflect on and employ at least two pragmatic and time-saving tips to assist with effective and efficient navigation of the medical setting. So why complete a medical chart review? What's the point to it all? According to ASHA, 2004 in their practice patterns document, they said, statements that define generally applicable characteristics of activities directed toward individual patients or clients and that address structural requisites of the practice, processes to be carried out, and expected outcomes. Within that section, within the practice patterns document, there is a subsection called consultation. And in that section, it states, and this is a direct quote, as appropriate to the situation, the consultant, which is you, gathers information through observations, interviews, assessments, or other direct services, and through review of records and materials. So effectively what it's saying is that at some point you still need to go through the medical chart whether you want to or not. This is the, private pra this is the practice pattern that you need to follow. And to be very honest with you, the information that's in there is definitely worthwhile. So maybe your first thoughts are, how do I begin? Where do I begin? And those are not, those are not simple questions to answer. And the remaining portions of this presentation, I hope, will address those in ways that are directly applicable with your practice. One of the other questions that you may be asking yourself is, do you need to do a thorough evaluation? Does the medical chart review allow you to do the thorough evaluation? Or perhaps the other side of it is, are you doing it simply because of billing and efficiency? Well, let's explore those a little bit. So what do you need to know in medical chart review? Those are the critical pieces. Those are the things that will help you with your patient. Well, one philosophical approach came from Mark Twain. And he said, the secret of starting, of getting started, is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks, and then starting on the first one. Practical advice, right? We do that every single day. You even do that right now by writing goals. You're writing short-term goals. Uh, even before that, you may have immediate goals. Maybe you just want to get the evaluation done. After that, you do your short-term goals and you do your long-term goals. Each of those can be considered steps on the way to progress for that patient. Well, the goals of, uh, and takeaways from medical chart review are to maintain compliance and to identify the reason for the consult, not necessarily what the patient's complaining of. And that may be something completely different. What I want you to take away from a medical chart review is to determine the supporting information for the consult. What is it about the information that's in the medical chart that says, I need to see the patient as a speech language pathologist? Second point, determine the patient's primary complaint. As I said, the diagnosis that you see in the medical chart may be very different from the actual complaint that the patient has. Determine whether and what additional information is needed before seeing the patient. So essentially, you're a fact gatherer, you're a sleuth. You're trying to find out the information that you need to even make the best choices for which assessment you use. And even before you get to that point, which questions you want to ask the patient to determine maybe or even fine tune what you do with the patient. Finally, you want to develop a working hypothesis for SLP diagnosis and patient presentation. Now, I know that's fancy speak with hypothesis. But all it really means is you want to have a best guess 
as to what you think this patient is going to look like when you walk into that room. That's the feeling that you want when you first walk away from that medical chart and on the way to see that patient. So what do medical charts provide? First off and foremost, they provide the medical and therefore legal memory of the patient's care and historical knowledge of the patient's care. Basically everything that's done to the patient, at the patient, for the patient, with the patient is in that medical chart. And it is a legal document. It is admissible into a court. So once you put your John Hancock on that document, it is admissible and you are responsible for it. Keep that in mind. The medical charts also provide results of completed treatments and testing. And of course, you want that information as well. They have plans from all the providers. You may know the SOAP note, and this is the P part of the note. It's the, probably the bottom most part of any given note in the medical chart. It's what are we doing, what's coming next, what's the plan? And it can be everything from the next test to patient discharge. Next point. Communication between providers. The medical chart, whether it's electronic, written, or otherwise, is a way for providers to discuss among themselves, seemingly in a non-oral communicative way, but verbally through the chart, what everybody's doing. It's the game plan within the pages and within the documents. Finally, necessary pieces to assure compliance with hospital and billing procedures. Basically what that means is that the, there are pieces that are mandated by federal, state, local governments, even within your own institution, that says these are the parts that keep us legally appropriate, responsible for the patient, compliant, and we can finally send a bill with some documentation. So what are the things that are in the medical chart that may be provided to you, but not necessarily? And these are the keys. These are the things that you're looking for, perhaps more so than the ones that are the givens. And that is the information to determine the etiology for each complaint. Meaning, you know what the complaints are very simply by the diagnosis and what the patient is saying. But you may not necessarily know why this is going on or what the cause of it is. That's what you're interested in. Decision making for the need of services. You're not going to be something, seeing something here similar to a geometry proof in that they're going to be going step by step through their reasoning necessarily. You're, but you may see because of X, then Y. Those are another key points to remember. Specific concerns related to each consult. So basically once the consult is over, the physician or the provider or the clinician will come back and they'll say, Yep, we believe it's this, but it may be that, and we need further testing for that. Those are good things to know because those will impact what you do with the patient. Then finally, the necessary information, but not all the information. As I said to you before, you may be completely up to date, but the reality is what's in the medical chart may not be up to date as you think it should be. Some key areas for review based largely on the diagnosis for the patient, and that is the admitting medical history. And that is when the patient comes into the emergency room, maybe the patient was transferred to the ICU or the, or the main floor, they'll read, take a paragraph, perhaps a few sentences and determine, uh, or they'll state to you what exactly it was that happened to the patient prior to that moment. They'll review everything. You'll see consults from various services. Among the ones that are probably most important to speech language pathology are neurology and neurosurgery, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, gastroenterology, and nutrition or clinical dietitians may offer something in, uh, along those lines. Finally, uh, pertinent radiologic evaluations will be very interesting for you to see, whether it be the chest film, the upper GI series, maybe some headshots of a CT scan or an MRI. Not to be overlooked, one of the major key areas are nursing notes. Because while the physicians and other consults may come in periodically, the nursing notes will take place absolutely daily and definitely multiple times within the day, even hourly, depending on the patient and their level of care. Other areas of interest in the medical chart include 
notes from additional consult services. So maybe there was a consult service that I mentioned that, uh, that I didn't mention on the previous slide. For example, infectious disease. Maybe the anesthesiologist. Maybe a surgeon. Those are important notes depending on what it is that you need exactly, what it is that you're looking for, the basis of why the patient is in the hospital. Occupational and physical therapy are also very important notes. Of course, there are major colleagues in allied health, but aside from that, they will tell you what kind of transfers the patient can do, whether they're gonna be able to stand up and do so fairly unaided for a radiologic exam. Uh, for example, the video fluoroscopic swallowing study. It, uh, and things of that nature. So bottom line is, they are very important notes, so don't discount those either. Orders, whether they're consults, therapies, or diets, the orders will give you an opportunity to see time-based and the focus of where the physicians are thinking next. And you'll be able to determine whether the diet you recommended was indeed ordered, never mind whether it showed up in the patient's room. Labs are very important, and uh, while new clinicians may not be very familiar with labs, they should get familiar with CBCs, complete blood counts, an electrolyte panel, maybe even just very simply um, some other labs, urinalysis, uh, blood counts uh, in other forms and so forth. So these will give you big clues as to what's going on with the patient. But keep in mind that those tests are sometimes dated, they're definitely timed, and that your interpretation from those results are relative to that time and date. The medication list is a very important thing from the standpoint of what you might be able to expect from the patient. That is, there are some medications that directly affect cognition. There are some medications that may even directly affect voice and swallowing. So you should be aware of those kinds of medications and plan accordingly. Notes from the emergency medical services or emergency medical team, the emergency department can be a little bit sketchy if they're available to you in the first place. But they're definitely worthwhile to take a look at because they'll provide information that will give you the basis of what they saw early on in the patient's hospital stay and things that may not even be covered in the histories that are provided by the first line providers by the time you see the patient on the floor. Transfer hospital notes are also very important. Transfers from the ICU to the medical ward will typically give a positive spin because the patient is being downgraded to a less intense level of care. Always good news. But the reverse happens as well. And you're gonna to wanna to know why that patient came back to the ICU or went to the ICU in the first place from the medical wards. Something happened, did the patient have something go on with their uh, heart? Did they have something go on with the respiratory system? Maybe it was an infection that couldn't be controlled by the floor and they needed a more intensive treatment. So those are things that you're going to want to note. Finally, notes from previous inpatient or outpatient visits. Again, these can be hit or miss. If you're part of a medical record that is electronic, probably a little bit easier to get access to those. But if you're still in a paper record, I wouldn't count it completely out, but your chances are not as high to get those records. So parsing the medical chart. This looks like a puzzle, doesn't it? And there are four pieces to it. One of the major pieces to it is the actual review, and that's why we're talking today. The review of the medical chart. You want the order to see the patient. If you don't have an order in the medical chart, you cannot see that patient, period. So make sure that that order exists, that it is signed, which is another compliance issue, and then you can see that patient. Then you can go through the medical record. Be careful. That always needs to be your first step. Second step is to take a look at the patient demographics. Who are they? Where did they come from? Are they local? Are they out of state? Are they out of the country? How old are they? Are they male or female? Here's one for you. Do you know how to pronounce their name? Believe it or not, that will go a long way with regard to patient rapport. Patient complaints. What is it that the patient came into the hospital complaining of and why are you seeing that patient now? So these may be wildly different, and I'll give you a simple example. Patient may have been 
uh, come into the emergency room complaining of problems that ultimately ended up as a urinary tract infection, a UTI. And suddenly you have a speech pathology consult. Well, those two don't make sense, do they? Somewhere along the lines, something happened. What happened? When did it happen? So knowing the patient complaints at the time that the physicians are ordering your consult, that's what you want to know. So the UTI is probably not important, but I'm guessing that they might be on some antibiotics. I'm guessing that the UTI may have caused some cognitive difficulties relative to the bacterial infection. And as a direct result of that, that would be the reason why you're seeing the patient, not the UTI. Patient medical and social history. You want to know what happened to the patient because you got to know where they're going from there. Medical history is extremely important in terms of have they been intubated? What kind of antibiotics have they been on? What did they can't come into the hospital with and what's new today? What about their social history? Were they smokers? Is the voice that you're hearing relative to that? Or did something happen uh, in the time that they came into the hospital that the voice you're hearing is wildly different? Maybe they're a drug user. Maybe they're recently divorced. All of this goes into social history and that will help you understand the patient. And knowing that information will not necessarily build rapport, but it'll keep you from misstepping in the clinic room and asking questions that you probably want to avoid. Finally, the medical plan, and that's everything that's in the medical chart. You want to know what's going on with that patient prior to walking into that room because you don't want to be surprised with information and then look like a deer in headlights with the patient telling you something a little bit odd. So all of this goes into your medical chart review. And ultimately, it is but one piece of the puzzle. What puzzle are we talking about? That's the chart knowledge. Other pieces include the nursing interview, the patient interview, and the clinical assessment. All four of those pieces are what I would refer to as the clinical presentation. Keeping in mind that that chart review is still one quarter of that information. So you're completing a very important part of this clinical presentation. So let's talk about proficiency in the medical chart review. What does it take to be proficient? Well, I, not to sound a little bit trite, but an expert knows all the answers, but that's only if you ask the right questions. And the reality is that you need to know what you're looking for in the medical chart, which are your questions, and which ones that you can avoid. So this is not based on data, but this is based on years of experience and talking with clinicians. I put together this graph. And on the bottom is a combination of book knowledge and clinical experience. On the left side of the graph, or the y-axis, is the amount of information that needs to be processed from medical chart review. As you can see, the first, chart of, uh, first part of the graph is typically the new clinician, whether it's the student or the new clinical fellow, this is the part that has an extremely steep learning curve. It's going to take lengthy periods of time in order to go through the medical chart in the way that you need to relative to where is everything and in the way that you need to relative to the amount of information that's there and what you need to be able to process. On the back side of the curve, that's kind of coming down from the yellow area and the green area, are the more seasoned clinicians, the more experienced clinicians, where not only do they have the knowledge to be able to parse the information, but they've spent so much time that they can cut straight to the chase. So the learning curve is considerably lower for them. The time spent is considerably less than those first starting out. But keep in mind that this is a process, and it's not timed in any way. So it may take you a month to figure this out in the facility you're in, or it may take a year to figure it out. And depending on the variety of your caseload, your growth will change relative to that. Maybe you're quicker with some patients with some diagnoses and not others, ones that you're less familiar with. Bottom line is, be patient and be tolerant, but you'll ultimately learn those right questions to ask. While you're learning the right questions, the one thing to keep in mind is another uh, approach, another philosophical approach, and that's something called Occam's Razor. 
What's Occam's razor? Well, I first learned about this from the movie Contact, if you've seen it. And it's very simply, among competing hypotheses, there's that word again, that predict equally well, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. Basically, that's just fancy talk for the simplest answer is probably the right one. Cut to the chase, get to the parts that you need to in a very simple, straightforward way. You don't need to go digging. So what about that electronic medical chart? Is going paperless really more, more efficient? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and it depends on where you are in the hospital. First one uh, is that there are multiple types of electronic charts. Ones can be, some can be therapy specific, others can be hospital unit specific, and others can be still service line specific, meaning the inpatient versus the outpatient. So what are the purposes of the electronic medical chart? Of course, we want to protect the patient's safety. So we don't need paper flying around the hospital. We don't need things that can be photocopied. We don't need things that can be taken out of the medical chart for convenience because nobody likes writing on three ring binders. So you may lose a, sh a page here or there. Electronic me medical records don't do that. Anything that you start, it is a database. There's no saving it per se because it's automatically saved. There's a safeguard. So patient safety is protected by everything that goes in the medical chart stays in the medical chart. Communication of observations and plans. We've spoken about that a little bit earlier in this talk. It is the very same thing as a paper medical chart. It is a way to communicate between the providers for that patient. And it's a good way of doing it. It's a pretty quick way of doing it as well because once it goes in, it's immediately available to every other person, no matter where they are in the hospital and sometimes even off campus. Billing verification. In most cases, what's going to happen is that you're going to put a medical diagnosis, ICD-9 currently moving to ICD-10. You may have a, uh, other codes that you put in, but the bottom line is that by the time that patient uh, is discharged from the hospital, the medical records will be fully available to the billing department. And the billing department is now going to match up the amount of time that was spent with the patient, with the patient diagnosis, and ultimately what you stated in your medical records, in your treatment, and in your diagnostic records. All of those need to line up in order for those folks to do their job. Finally, it is a legal record. Once again, whether it's electronic or it's on paper, the electronic medical record or the medical records broadly are legal documents. These are things that can be subpoenaed. These are things that can appear in courts of law, for example, during malpractice trials. So be careful. What you're looking at right here is an example of a therapy medical record. Now this particular system called Metalinks, many of you may be familiar with, is very typically the medical record system for physical and occupational therapies as well as speech language pathologists. Only those folks typically enter information into these records. Ultimately, because these are part of the electronic medical record, the records placed here are then transferred electronically or pulled from this system into other systems in the hospital. Once they're pulled into these other systems in the hospital, the notes placed here for therapies, certainly for billing and compliance and other issues, are then placed in an area where all providers will have access to them. Because sadly, providers won't have access to this system. It's simply an easy, somewhat ubiquitous way for therapists to put their notes in when the other portions of the medical record systems are not available to us. A second type of electronic medical record is the unit specific or hospital unit specific medical record. These medical records are often relative to ICUs. They may be related to step down units. Maybe they even got so far as the floor, the medical wards, maybe even the inpatient rehab unit. But the bottom line is that they are unit specific, meaning that everything that you look at within this medical record is relative to the floor you're on or the unit you're on. 
And that doesn't matter what service you're on. So whether you're a therapist or you're a physician or you're a nurse, all of the records will be put here into one place. And once you pull up that unit, you'll be able to see all of the patients on that unit and then you'll be able to go to the specific patient you're interested in. So that's a second way of taking a look at the medical record that's in some institutions. A third way of taking a look at the electronic medical record is the service line, and that's the inpatient versus the outpatient medical record. Now, here it gets a little bit more interesting because sometimes what happens on the inpatient side is edited and you may not necessarily see all of the details that you normally would in the other uh, electronic medical records. So what happens is when you come into this medical record, you'll see some inpatient records, major records like discharge summaries, maybe admission notes, things of that nature, but you're not going to see, for example, the flow sheets in an ICU on any given day. Those will simply not exist in this kind of medical record. So you have to be aware of that before you get into this medical record. Now, are those medical records still avail available? Absolutely. They're just not here. You may have to go back to the unit specific and pull up historical information in order to get it. At least that's the way it's working in our institution. Maybe different than yours. In outpatient medical records, I can't think of an instance where a single outpatient visit is not captured on this type of medical record, meaning all outpatient visits will be captured with this kind of medical record. So far, I haven't seen anything different, and it works quite well. So again, you may want to figure out which service line you're interested in, what level of care you're interested in, and definitely relative to the dates, because that's going to pay, play a big part in trying to find the medical records that you're interested in. So let's summarize a little bit. What have I gone over? What are the take-home pieces? First one, first and foremost, is to remind yourself that learning is a process. These are things that are not going to happen overnight. They're going to happen through a period of time, and through time, things will become a lot easier. But don't expect it to happen right this minute. Medical chart review, assessment, and treatment are constantly evolving processes. So be open to the changes that occur, especially in the electronic medical records. If anything's going to change more than anything else, it's going to be software upgrades. So be prepared. Simple is generally better for everyone, and that includes everything regarding the medical chart process. And whether it's the information that you're gathering or what you put into the medical record, at the very least, what you want to do is be succinct and be clear. Simple is best, and I promise you, your notes will be read a whole lot easier. So how do you do that in a fairly efficient way? First one is to stay focused and be disciplined. The big issue here is that it's really tempting to go off into different areas of the medical record. How neat is that that the patient had this? And how cool is that, that I could learn something new? Well, that's not going to help your efficiency. Be focused on the things that you need in order to get out fairly quickly. You want to do double duty by reviewing and completing the medical reports at the same time. That is, if you're working in an electronic environment, copy and paste information from previous notes into your current notes. No need to get creative here. That's not the environment. Simply copy and paste will take you a long way, and it'll save you a lot of time. Most computer operating systems allow for multitasking. So if you're familiar with the ways that you can switch between screens uh, using either operating system or any operating system, that'll save you some time. If you're at all uh, able to, on larger screens, put up two windows at the same time, that will save you time instead of one screen disappearing right behind the other. So either way, the less clicks, the more efficient you are. Finally, here's a great pointer, but it's going to take you some upfront time. And that is, create yourself some templates and summaries for standardized tests and things that you frequently use, like goals uh, and hierarchical treatments. 
If you set those aside and make them readily accessible, and whether it's on the computer that you're on and using as a therapist, whether it's on the unit computer, and you may have to keep that in some uh, corner of that computer, or maybe it's just a simple thumb drive, keep those available to you because copy and paste, as I said, is your friend. You might as well take the stuff that you had the time to think about to be able to put them into the medical record. I have offered you an appendix that will give you some idea as to how to uh, approach these patients. And I offer you any, any opportunity to email me if you have questions. I'll be happy to take those as well. Thank you so much for, the, for attending this presentation. And I wish you best of luck in reviewing the medical chart.